Hello, my name is David Ahern, and today I will be doing a psychological criticism of Phil Clay's redeployment. This story focuses on the psychological disorder of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. In order to see what PTSD really entails, we can look to the Neuroscience and Behavioral Physiology Journal, where an article gives us a very good definition. This article states that PTSD alters emotional, volitional, and cognitive functions, preventing service at hotspots and, after return to peaceful conditions, impairs social and family adaptation and work-related obligations, and increases the problem of developing nervous system diseases. This makes studies of the clinical features of PTSD and its, and its risk factors important, and defines the need to assess retention of service cap capacity in military personnel in war zones. In another article in Military Medicine Journal, we can see that Marines of all branches of the military exhibit qualities of PTSD the most, and it is estimated that 18.5% of service members returning from Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom meet the criteria for either post-traumatic stress disorder or depression. Marines exhibit a 12.2% chance to develop depression, a 12.9% chance to develop PTSD, and a 5.8% chance to develop an alcohol abusive disorder. In Phil Clay's redeployment, we see his characters exhibit some of these traits as they struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder. An author named Donald Anderson did an article on Phil Clay's re redeployment, and in it we learned that he was actually a Iraqi Marine who came home and decided to become a writer. Phil Clay likely saw many of his friends develop PTSD, and perhaps even himself, and we could see this in his short story, Redeployment. The story is told in the voice of a narrator who does not say his name, but tells us of his journey back from his last mission in Iraq, and how him and his comrades, his platoon members, would go to Ireland and drink and have fun before returning home to meet with their families and to continue their lives as normal civilians. The narrator tells us of his most traumatic experience when he was overseas was that of his Operation Scooby, in which him and his platoon members would have to go out and kill dogs. This stuck with the narrator especially, because he was a very big dog lover, and actually owns a dog back home that he's very close with. When the narrator returns home, he notices that he cannot control his thoughts. In this quote, we see this. The problem is, your thoughts don't come out in any kind of straight order. You don't think, oh, I did A, then B, then C, then D. You try to think about home. Then you're in the torture house. You see the body parts in the locker and the retarded guy in the cage. He squawked like a chicken. His head was shrunk down to a coconut. It takes you a while to remember Doc saying they'd shoot mercury, in, they'd shot mercury into his skull, and then it still doesn't make any sense. You see things you saw the times you nearly died, the broken television and the Haji corpse, Eccles covered in blood, the lieutenant on his on the radio. Eckholtz was actually one of his comrades who had fallen in, by an insurgent while in Iraq. This quote is very powerful because it shows that the narrator and most of his platoon members cannot think straight at all, and that they could see only the torturous and very vile images that they have saw, they had seen in Iraq and have not been able to escape their brains since returning home. The narrator comes into contact with his wife, who is suspecting that perhaps her husband has gone insane. She says, how are you? And to the narrator, and to her, it meant, how was it? Are you crazy now? The narrator responds, good, I'm fine. 
By the time the war in Iraq was going on, people had a very good idea about what PTSD was. People were afraid that their loved ones would come home and then would have to be worrying about having their loved ones being set off by hot spots, as we discussed earlier, and would have developing nervous system disorders, as well as depression and alcoholism. The character of Corporal Weishart especially struggles with alcoholism. This is seen in the following quote. Corporal Weishart's wife wasn't there at all when we got back. He left, and she probably got the time wrong, and O'Leary gave him a ride to his house. They got there, and it's empty. Not just of people, of everything. Furniture, wall hangings, everything. Weishart looks at, at this shit and shakes his head. Starts laughing. They went out, bought some whiskey, and got fucked up right there in his empty house. Weishart drank himself to sleep, and when he woke up, McManigan was right next to him, sitting on the floor. And McManigan, of all people, was one who cleaned him up and got him into base on time for the classes they make you take about. Don't kill yourself. Don't beat your wife. And Weishart was like, I can't beat my wife. I don't know where the fuck she is. Now, alcoholism does not embody all of post-traumatic stress disorder. As we learned about earlier, it is the triggers that really set off the remembering of the past in a current environment that is not dangerous as the person who's struggling struggling with the disorder experiences in his mind. We see this struggle in the narrator, especially in the following quote. When traveling to the market for some clothes shopping, the narrator explains to us a situation. He says, So here's an experience. Your wife takes you shopping in Wilmington. Last time you walked down the street, your Marine on point went down the side of the road, checking ahead and scanning the roofs across from him. The Marine behind him checks the windows on the top levels of the building. The Marine behind him gets the windows on the lower level. And so on until your guys have the street level covered and the Marine in back has the rear. In a city, there's a million places they can kill you from. It freaks you out at first, but you go with it. You go through like you were trained, and it works. In Wilmington, you don't have a squad. You don't have a battle buddy. You don't even have a weapon. You startle ten times checking for it, and it's not there. The narrator is fearful, even in the simple situation of buying clothes, that he may be under attack. This is a clear and distinct example of post-traumatic stress disorder where a person, the narrator, feels that he is in a different situation due to a trigger. The trigger is walking down the street, which reminds him of his battle and how he used to walk down the street in fear for, from his life, in fear for his life. We see another, another trigger come about when the narrator is speaking about his killing of his dog. He says, it's not a far drive. We got there right at sunset. I parked just off this road, got out, pulled out my rifle from the trunk, slung it over my shoulders and moved to the passenger side. I opened the door and lifted Vicar up in my arms and carried him down to the stream. He was heavy and warm and he licked my face as I carried him, slow, lazy licks from a dog that's been happy all his life. When I put him down and stepped back, he looked up at me. He wagged his tail, and I froze. Only one other time had I hesitated like that. Midway through Fallujah, an insurgent snuck through our perimeter. When we raised the alarm, he disappeared. We freaked, scanning everywhere, until Curtis looked down in his water cistern that had been used as a cesspit, basically a big round container filled a quarter way with liquid shit. The insurgent was floating in it, hiding beneath the liquid and only coming up for air. It was like a fish rising to grab a fly sitting on the top of water. His mouth would break the surface, open for a breath, and then snap shut. 
and he'd submerge. I couldn't imagine it. Just smelling it was bad enough. About four or five marines aimed straight down, fired into the shit, except me. Staring at Vicar, it was the same thing, this feeling, like something in me is going to break if I do this. And I thought of Cheryl bringing Victor, Vicar to the vet, of some stranger putting his hands on my dog, and I thought, I have to do this. The narrator is triggered by the frozenness he experiences with the delay that comes when a, when a man or a woman puts their dog down. He reminds himself of an attack from an insurgent in Iraq when this happens, which only makes his life even more terrible because now not only does he have to put down his loving dog, he has to remember a very dark time when he almost died due to a, an attack by an insurgent. The high prevalence among military members in the United States who have come out of battle and have faced post-traumatic stress disorder is grim. Phil Clay was in battle, and he likely knew many people who developed PTSD later on, and perhaps even himself. What we can determine is that he, was a, he did a phenomenal job in portraying what it's truly like for a person to have PTSD and to look past just definitions and numbers in the human context. Through characters like Corporal Weishart and the narrator, we see this especially in redeployment. When the narrator goes to shopping and he is putting down his dog, he senses danger that is really not there. This is paranoia. And this is an aspect of postmodernism. The chaos that is PTSD is insurmountable in the story. The narrator cannot do anything about the way he feels. The images that come up in his head when he's going shopping or when he's, when he's putting down the dog or when he's trying to think. He can only see back to his torturous days in, in Iraq where he feared for his life and sought death. For this reason, along with paranoia, I believe this is a work of postmodernism. Thank you for viewing this psychological criticism of Phil Kay's redeployment with a emphasis on post-traumatic stress disorder. In the comments section, you will find the bibliography. And if you have any questions for me, please feel free to message me or leave a comment below.